In this module, we're going to be discussing principal component analysis. Now, principal component analysis is a way for us to reduce the number of dimensions of a given data set. The reason we want to do that is because it's a lot easier for us to work with smaller number of dimensions, or we'll consider them variables, than it is to say larger ones, like taking a 40 column data set and reducing it into two or three easily understood dimensions. And the reason for this is because large data sets present a unique challenge for us. And this occurs in a number of ways. First of all, we may have 40 dimensions or 40 variables. However, not all of those variables are critical to analysis. But some may have certain elements or certain contributions when they're put in a group. If we analyze one variable at a time, it can be very time consuming. And more importantly, it may lead to inaccurate results. We may focus on a particular variable, and that variable may tell us something, but in the context of 39 other variables, we could be missing the complete picture. And therefore, we lose this richness of multidimensional data. The difficulty in working with large data sets also stems from the computing power as well as interpretation. Humans can also more easily process data in smaller dimensions as opposed to larger ones. So we're going to start off with an example. Here's a data set that we'll call the housing data set, which is available in a number of different sites. And we'll make this available on the blog as well. A cursory look at the data shows that it contains nine columns and 20,000 observations. So while in practice, many data sets will have more than nine columns, it still represents a challenge for us to reduce the number of dimensions from nine to something more meaningful. Running a summary statistics in R, we can see the descriptives table just telling us about the particular columns. In this case, we have a number of different columns that are all continuous. So principal component analysis is concerned with explaining the variance-covariance structure of a set of variables. But this explanation comes from a few linear combinations of the original variables. So consider what we're doing is we're creating new variables as linear combinations or a formula with coefficients to represent the data. It has two primary objectives. Number one is data reduction. We're going to move from many original variables like 40 down to a few composite variables, say three. The second is interpretation. When we group these variables together into this particular dimension, and we understand the weight associated with those variables to a particular dimension, it actually will give us a way to interpret that grouping. And so this will play a larger role in explanation of total variance. So think of the new variables, these principal components, as composite variables consisting of a mixture of the original variables. In PCA, the ultimate goal is to find a set of K principal components or composite variables. We're going to find K functions, and each of those functions has coefficients against each variable. And each one of these is much smaller than the original set of P variables in terms of explaining the variance. So each principal component will have an amount of variance that it explains of the total data set. Each successive one will actually account for a little bit more, but not as much as the first. And putting them all together will account for nearly all of the total sample variance. If these two goals can be accomplished, then this set of K principal components, hopefully smaller than the number of variables we have, contains as much information as the total number of original P variables, the number of variables that we have. This means that the K principal components can then replace P original variables. Thus, we can say that the original data set is thereby reduced from N measurements or N observations on P variables to N measurements or observations on K variables. PCA often reveals relationships between variables that were not previously suspected. And the reason for this is because we're grouping variables together to form a composite variable. In fact, when we group them together, we might actually get a name for them, assuming that we have three variables grouped together, say math scores, writing scores, and science scores, that grouping could be considered an academic score or an academic dimension. 
Because of these relationships, these new interpretations of the data often stem from PCA. As we mentioned, if we're combining the three particular variables, we might create an interpretation that these three variables are considered an academic score or an academic dimension. In general, PCA serves as a means to an end rather than an end in of itself. Because we're creating a new variable from these other variables, we're creating this composite with the weighted coefficients. It's going to give us a new value. And therefore, that value by itself doesn't have as much meaning until we use it in another type of analysis, such as doing a correlation or even potentially using it in a regression. So the principal components are these composite variables that are created by combinations of the original variables, and they're formed by a set of linear combinations. So for p variables, we will be able to form a total of p components using PCA. But in the end, we're going to only use a few of them. So let Y stand for these new composite variables or principal components. The linear combinations will look like Y1 equals a matrix A transposed, which will correspond to the weights, times an X matrix, which will have the values of the variables themselves. And so therefore, we have Y1 will equal A11X1 plus A12X2 all the way to A1PXP and we will form p of these functions. So if we have 40 variables, we will have 40 formulas. So recall from previous models that variability, as measured by variance, is a critical understanding for a particular column of data. And thus, the covariance matrix informs the analyst of the overall variability of data. We have data, we create a covariance matrix, and the diagonal of the covariance matrix is the individual variances. So taking our example of 40 variables, each of the variables will have a certain amount of variance. Put them together and we're going to get a total variance for the entire data set. We're going to call that the total variability of the sample data set. So essentially, the total sample variance provides us a way to describe the entire sample covariance matrix with a single number. And that is actually obtained by taking the trace of the covariance matrix. Recall that the trace is summing up the diagonal. And the diagonal of a covariance matrix was nothing more than the variance of each one of the variables. So like generalized variance, the total sample variance reflects the overall spread of the data in multidimensional space. Many multivariate techniques use the total sample variance in computation of the variance accounted for. So assume we have a sample covariance matrix, S. Recall that the variances of the variables are along the diagonal. Therefore, the total sample variance of covariance matrix S can be calculated by the trace of the matrix. Thus, the trace of S, is, in this case, is equal to 32. Our aim will be to find principal components which would be able to account for as much of this variance as possible. In PCA, the linear combinations each are formed by weighting each original variable so that the following conditions are met. The variance of each successive component is smaller than the previous component. So here we have the variance of Y1 is always going to be greater than the variance of Y2, and so forth all the way over to the variance of YP. The covariance or correlation between any two different principal components is zero. They will be independent of each other. And that's an interesting concept, because what we're doing is when we create these new variables, or when we create these new principal components, we're going to make them orthogonal to each other. They're going to create their own new set of dimensions. The sum of the variances of the principal components are equal to the total sample variance. So now, when we have the variances of each principal component and we add them up, they will be equal to the total sample variance of the data set. Each principal component is formed by taking the values of the elements of the eigenvectors as the weights of the linear combination. If each eigenvector has elements e, i, k, so for each eigenvector, we're going to use those to create the new principal components, where y1 equals e11x1 
E2, 1, X2, and so forth. And Y2 will be equal to E1, 2, X1, E2, 2, X2, and so forth. Conceptually, the chart at the right here shows only two dimensions of a data set, just for graphical purposes. The first principal component will be in the direction of the maximum variance from the origin. So we will take this, the maximum spread from the center point or from the origin, and we find that it is a diagonal going upward from bottom left to top right. All subsequent principal components are going to be orthogonal or perpendicular to the first principal component and describe the maximum residual variance. This second principal component here is shown in blue, while the first one is shown in red. The goal will be to explain or summarize the underlying variance-covariance structure of a large data set through a few linear combinations. But let's see what happens. The final product, if we ran a PCA, might look like the following. Let's first start with our original data set, and we've drawn the axis in the dashed black line here. We have a point x1 and x2. If we look at this data set, we can clearly see that the widest dispersion will occur again, like we said, from bottom left to top right. So recall that this coordinate here in space, this x1, x2, sits in the original coordinate space where we have the vertical line and the horizontal line. But what we'll do is we will draw a new line. This is going to represent the direction of the maximum variance. And that represents our first dimension. What we'll then do is we will actually take another dimension, orthogonal to that one, representing the maximum variance in the particular direction. If we had 40 dimensions, if we had 40 dimensions, it's not easier to see, but it wouldn't look as clean as this. But again, for two dimensions and for our example, this will suffice. Now, because we've drawn two new dimensions, the orange lines represented here are showing us the new coordinate system where this point actually lies. So instead of lying where it originally did at x1, x2, it now lies at x1 prime, x2 prime. And in the coordinate space using these red and blue lines, it will actually have a different value. What we also have are these lambdas. So this lambda 1 represents the length of the first principal component or the how much variance there is in that principal component. And lambda 2 represents the length or the variance associated in the second principal component. So the eigenvalues, recall, are your lambdas, and the eigenvectors will form the principal component equations. But what we've now said and shown graphically is that the lambda 1 represents the amount of variance or the variance in that first principal component and the lambda 2 will represent the variance in the second principal component. Before we get into running the PCA, let's deal with a couple of assumptions. First of all, PCA does not specifically presume any type of data for the analysis. There are many people who prefer to think of PCA for only continuous variables, but there are numerous examples where this is not the case. However, it wouldn't suffice to just use principal component analysis for categorical variables. There's another method for that called correspondence analysis, which will be in a later video. If the variables happen to be multivariate normal, then the principal components will also be multivariate normal, with a zero mean vector and a covariance matrix that has zero off-diagonal elements and diagonal elements equal to the eigenvalues of the principal components. But let's run PCA and see what we get. So using that housing data set, we're going to use the facto minor package. So here we have the code for making sure that we would load it up the facto minor package. And we're going to actually produce the output into a variable called res.pca. The function will take the data set as an x variable. It'll take scale.unit equals true. This will basically refer to the data in a unit variance or normalizing the data. NCP represents the number of components, and graph equals true will say that it will draw the graph. In the key case for the NCP, if you have 10 variables, or in our case we have 9, it, by specifying NCP equals 5, it will only show us a 5 principal component solution, even though there will be 9 principal components. 
you can change this to be the total number of columns in your data set to see all of the principal components. Now, before we move forward, recall that PCA will create components based on the variability. And there are two options to creating the PCA, using the correlation matrix, which is standardized, or the covariance matrix, which is not standardized. In general, using the correlation matrix is better than the covariance matrix. And that's because when you use the covariance matrix by itself, with variables that are on different scales, the results may tend to be skewed in terms of the way they look. Using a correlation matrix is equivalent to a covariance matrix that has standardized observations. So if your data is standardized and you take a covariance matrix, you'll end up with the same results as using the correlation matrix. The resulting principal component values are calculated based on the standardized observations. And this is what we'll use when we do our analysis. The results of the analysis can produce different interpretations than a PCA with the original variables. So when you're using the original variables in the original scale, you may end up seeing some different loadings and therefore your interpretations might be different as opposed to using the correlation matrix. So it is advised that PCA be used with correlations when variables with widely different scales of measurements are included in the analysis. Now, when we run our PCA using the factor minor package, this is an example of what the results look like with the housing data. We will obtain a series of eigenvalues, which we'll explain shortly, and it will tell us where the individual observations fit on particular dimensions. Here we see dimension one, dimension two, and dimension three, which is what we're going to focus on. And we're also going to focus on the variables and how they line up to the dimensions, because this will tell us how the variables begin to load with each other. Again, across dimension one, dimension two, and dimension three. Now, in your analysis, you may have more than three dimensions as we're showing here. We'll show you how to do that. So let's look at the variables first. In creating a principal component equation, for each dimension here, dimension one, dimension two, and dimension three, each one of the values in the dimension are the weights, or what we'll call the loadings, for the particular variables. So here we can see y1 as our first principal component, as 0.15 of x1. In this case, x1 is our longitude variable. Then we'll add a negative 1.49 times our latitude variable, which we'll refer to as x2. And we will do this for each one of the successive variables across that dimension. y2 being the second dimension will be the next set of coefficients or loadings multiplied by their respective variables. Again, representing them as x1, x2, longitude, latitude, and so forth. Once you have your equations, one of the next questions is going to be, well, how many principal components do you need? And there are a few guidelines that you can use towards the selection of the number of principal components. The four are an eigenvalue criterion, also known as the Kaiser rule, proportion of variance explained, scree plot criterion, and the minimum communality criterion. So once we calculated our principal components, the number of meaningful principal components can be determined by examining the principal components with an eigenvalue greater than one. This is known as the Kaiser rule, or eigenvalue criterion. So this would be synonymous to explaining at least one variable's variability. So it means that that dimension explains that number of variables' variability. So unfortunately, when there are less than 20 variables, the eigenvalue criterion tends to select less principal components than may be necessary, while if there are more than 50, it tends to select too many. So down below, let's take a look at these three dimensions. Dimension one has an eigenvalue of 3.907, and that's clearly greater than one. And its interpretation is that it represents the variability of 3.9 variables can be explained by this one dimension. Now recall, we have nine variables, so that's a pretty good number. Dimension two explains 1.922 variables, and dimension three, 1.697. So the three dimensions here are clearly greater than one. And at the fourth dimension, it's only explaining 0.91, or less than one of the variable's variability. 
So for the eigenvalue criterion, we're going to choose those that are greater than 1. And in this case, it's three dimensions. Now, the analyst must make a distinction between eigenvalues that are slightly greater or slightly less than 1 whether or not to keep a dimension that's, say, 0.99 or 0.98 in terms of an eigenvalue. So we'll use the other criterion to help us. We can use the percentage of variance explained by the individual component to make a determination. So generally, we want to take the first n components with a proportion variance explained somewhere between 65 and 85%. But the actual number is up to the analyst and the domain in which the data is being examined. So here, when we look at dimension 1, it explains 43% of the variance. Dimension 2 explains 21.361, but cumulatively that number is 64.767. If we add dimension 3, which explains 18% of the variance, the total is now 83.622. And again, three dimensions here seems to be good enough. Now you may ask, well, why wouldn't we want more dimensions? Take a fourth or fifth. Well, remember, one of the key reasons we want to do this is to reduce the number of dimensions so that we have an easier time interpreting or doing our analysis. So adding an additional dimension increases the level of complexity. The analyst will make a subjective determination as to whether or not the added dimensions are necessary. Now in a screen plot examination, what we're going to do is we're going to look for where the point of leveling occurs. So we will draw a scree plot from our solution, and we see that by the fifth dimension it begins to level off. There doesn't seem to be much of a difference in successive dimensions. So we'll go one behind that point, and we'll get a determination of four components using this scree plot assessment. And finally, the fourth way is the minimal communality criterion. Communality represents the proportion of variance of a particular variable is shared with other variables. Communalities provide an indication of the importance of each variable in the PCA solution. So in other words, how important each variable is in a particular dimension. Variables with smaller communalities contribute less to the PCA solution than other variables and are indicative of a less important variable. Therefore, the analyst should be looking for variables with large communalities, as this indicates more of a representation of variance explained. In order to calculate the communality for a variable, we square each of the component weights across all principal components and sum up the values to obtain the communality. Generally, communalities less than 40 to 50 percent are sharing less than half of its variability with other variables. So we have a function called communality, which we've written for you and is located on our blog site. The sample code will show you how to run this. Here we can see in dimension one that total rooms, total bedrooms, population, and households appear to have greater than 50% communality in dimension one. When we move to dimension two, latitude and longitude are now moved to 86 and 93% respectively. So dimension two is explaining a significant percentage of the variance there. We continue with this process until we find that all of the variables in our solution are explained by the dimensions, at least 50%. You'll notice here in dimension three that only 18.75% of the last variable, housing median age, is explained. And therefore, it's explained in the fourth dimension. So this communality criterion will specify a four-dimension solution. However, an alternative would be that the analyst decides they do not want to include housing median age because it's not necessarily germane to their analysis. If that were the case, then it would drop back to the third dimension. So given the four criterion, we have the following summary. The eigenvalue criterion is choose the components with an eigenvalue of one or greater. Proportion of variance explained means to choose the components with a cumulative proportion of variance greater than a specified amount, somewhere between 65 and 85 percent. The scree plot criterion uses the scree plot to determine the point before the scree point line flattens. 
and the minimum communality criterion is to choose the number of components where each variable has a communality of at least 50%. In the houses example, the eigenvalue and proportion of variance explained indicate three components is sufficient. However, the scree plot and communality criterion indicates four. So from the houses example, we can show that four components are probably good to correspond to the latent attributes, that is, those variables that are not seen. Using the display PC function, which is also available on the blog site, this function will actually keep only those values above a certain cutoff so that it's easier to read. We can see that dimension one really refers to size, total rooms, total bedrooms, population, say households, Dimension 2 refers to geography or location. Dimension 3 seems to have something related to income and value. And Dimension 4 is really by itself, it's the housing median age. But this is how we can describe the four components. Now we might want to plot the first two principal components on a two-dimensional plot just to see where they line up. And if we do that, and PCA does this automatically for you by specifying the graph equals true parameter in the PCA function. And we could see that many of the items seem to fall along that horizontal axis, which explains about 43.4% of the total variance. And dimension two is 21% of the variance, and it seems to have longitude and latitude on the vertical axis, along with the median house value and median income. Again, this is what it would look like if it was only two dimensions. But this gives us an idea of where everything lines up. However, if you notice, they're still not necessarily perfectly in line with each other in terms of aligning to at least the two dimensions. So in order to interpret principal components more clearly, rotation of these can be performed. There are a number of different rotations, but we will focus exclusively on Varimax in this section. So suppose we have a population measured on p random variables. These represent variables on the p axes of the Cartesian coordinate system in which the population resides. So this is our actual graph with the actual data. The red lines will actually be the new principal components. And what we will do is we will attempt to rotate everything so that we can get the points to line up to those new Cartesian coordinates. In order to do this, we're going to use what's called a Varimax rotation. The Varimax rotation will allow the components to be rotated based on the maximum variance between the components, therefore representing the data more clearly to each principal component. So in other words, it's going to change the loadings because we can have these rotational solutions without losing our interpretation. The code for doing this is below. What we'll do is we'll take the results of the loadings which is in the coord object of the variable object of the PCA result object, and that's noted here. We'll pass that into the Varimax function and extract the loadings. And we'll just put that into a new variable called loadings.pca rotation or PCA rote. That now has the new Varimax rotations. These new rotations can then be put back into the PCA result and we can plot them according to the way PCA plots the loadings. And therefore, this is what the rotation looks like. It will take this slightly off axis loadings and rotate them so that we end up with something that's going to be even more closely aligned to the actual axes. And you can see here from the left, which is unrotated dimensions, to the right, which is Varimax rotated dimensions. But across multiple dimensions, here's what happens. When we display the results, we see that the numbers became a little bit higher. Whereas in the top, we have the total rooms, total bedrooms, population, and households. You can see that some of the numbers became slightly higher uh, in terms of their loadings in the first dimension. And in the second dimension, they became higher as well. And in the third dimension, those values became higher. And the fourth dimension, it became higher. And this is important because when you have loadings that aren't necessarily clear, let's say you have a 0.67 or a 0.77, by doing a Varimax rotation, 
the numbers might end up being much, much higher and more clearly aligned to one component or another, especially when it's possible for one variable to load on two dimensions. Now, once we've obtained our PCA values and we've obtained our loadings, the formulas of the principal components can then be used to create these new values. So for principal component one, this example is not using the rotated solution. This example is using the unrotated solution. So here we have 0.15x1 plus minus 0.149x2 as we had in our original equation. Therefore, we will take each value from a given observation and apply it into the function so that we will get a new value a y1 value or pc1 value for that observation. So we will just take the latitude, the longitude for a particular observation, and so forth, plug them into the equation for all nine variables, and compute a new value, which we'll call y1 or pc1. So the first observation would yield three numbers, since if we would choose a three principal component solution, we would get 42,307.166 for pc1, 119,411.488 for PC2, and 397,388.40 for PC3. The only reason why we didn't do the fourth one is we're just trying to streamline here what we're trying to visualize. Now we can easily do this instead of trying to write code to do all of the values, we can use matrix multiplication to get us the new values. So here, we'll take our original data, which here is called CA data fixed, and we'll convert it to a matrix, as dot matrix. We'll do a matrix multiplication and multiply it by the coordinate objects of the variable object of the PCA result, but we're only going to take the first three columns, which corresponds to the first three dimensions. We'll convert that to a matrix, and the result will be an N row with number of principal component columns matrix. Because remember, if our matrix, let's say, had nine variables, if our data had nine variables and say 20,000 observations, that would be a 20,000 by nine matrix. On the other side, recall that our PCA solution actually has nine rows for standing for each of the variables and three columns. So that would be a 20,000 by nine multiplied by a matrix that was 9 by 3, and therefore the result would be 20,000 by 3 matrix. Now the PCA object from Facto Minor has a number of different items available. So you can actually extract the eigenvalues directly by doing dollar sign EIG after your result object, dollar sign var to abstract some different things out of the variables like coord, core, cosine 2, and contrib. The IND object is for individual observations, again with coord, cosine 2, and contrib. And then some call functions which are summary statistics and mean of the variables and so forth. But we'll focus on the variables and individual observations. The objects of coord provides the coordinates of the variable or observation on the particular dimension. If you're using a correlation matrix, these values will be in the unit circle between negative 1 and 1, because they'll stand for a correlation. And those are our loadings. And this is what we've been using over the previous slides. The core provides a correlation value of the variable or observation to the particular dimension. But if you're using the correlation matrix, the values will be identical to the chord object. Now the cosine squared provides the quality of representation. It provides an estimate of how much contribution of the variable or observation there is to the dimension. It is the squared cosine. The closer the value to one, the better representation it has to the variable. And there are a number of different interpretations, but suffice it to say, if it's below 0.3, there isn't much representation. If it's above 0 0.6, 0 0.7, there is a lot of representation. Everything in between will be based on the domain that you're doing your analysis in. Contrib provides a percent of contribution the variable or observation has on the particular dimension. And if you add these all up, you will get 100%. It is accumulating the percent of contribution the variable has 
on the particular dimension, and it will provide you with a significant weight to know how much contribution a variable has on the dimension.